Hello and welcome to the Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, one of Nigeria's top journalists, best known political columnist, respected author and former presidential spokesman Olusegun Adeniyi talks to us today about gruesome jihadist attacks and growing insecurity in the Northeast about youth unemployment breaking the 14 million mark amidst the mounting violence of the insurgency and banditry and about the challenges of being a presidential spokesman in Nigeria. Olusegun Adeniyi, a man who it can be said has had a journalism career to die for in a moment. And later, the distinctive artwork of Nigeria's Jacqueline Sowari. Stunning pieces that continue to attract national and international attention in the US, Europe and across Nigeria. Her unique style involves the use of a ballpoint pen, ink and acrylic on paper. Basic tools with which she creates rich, intricate portraits that are being celebrated around the world. The magically talented Jacqueline Sowari coming up. Now, in the wake of the deadly attacks in northeast Nigeria by Boko Haram militants that left dozens of farmers dead, the Nigerian military says it's killed scores of Boko Haram militants after it launched multiple strikes in the Sambisa forest, where the jihadists are thought to have their largest training camp in the country. The army said it used military jets and helicopter gunships to attack and destroy three militant locations used as staging areas for the planning and launching of attacks. A suspected anti-aircraft gun station was also taken out. Meanwhile, the attack on that farming community in Zabamari is leading to fear in the region and outrage across Nigeria. There are reports that farmers have stopped going to their fields in several parts of the country, which could lead to further food inflation, according to the All Farmers Association of Nigeria. There have been calls from various normally supportive quarters, not least the Northern Elders Forum, for President Buhari to resign for his apparent inability to tackle mounting security challenges. Both the Senate and the House of Representatives have passed resolutions warning that excuses will no longer be tolerated. All of this and more captured most articulately by one of Nigeria's best-known columnists, Olusegun Adeniyi, who is the current chairman of the board of editors of This Day Newspapers and former presidential spokesman under Umaru Musa Yaradua. And I'm enraptured beyond measure to say that we managed to drag the suitably brilliant Shegu Adeni kicking and screaming mm -hmm. into the studio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say this, and he's here with me. Absolutely yeah. deliriously yeah. delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, for thanks, in. Charles, for dragging me here. You know me, you know, I, I don't <laughs> like camera. And I also try to manage my public engagement. And I'll tell you a story. In 2012, after mm -hmm. I came back from Harvard, I think a, 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 a six months into the pro there was a program at the villa, and Ruben invited me. So and it was a so media. Ruben Abati. Yes, right. I mean, he's my friend, and he was then the presidential spokesman. So yes. it was uh, President Jonathan at the time, and there was it. It was supposed to be an engagement, and I didn't even know that uh, President Jonathan saw me. So while he was speaking, he, just, he said, "Well, some people used to be here before they knew how tough the terrain is." Now they are there in the media <laughs> writing nonsense and everybody <laughs> loud. So I, 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 because of I've worked at the villa before, yes, I try to understand the terrain. I try as much as possible to be fair to people in government. Because I was also there before. So because of that, I, I like I said, I tried not to, I, I minimize my public engagement. Yeah. Let, let me just put it that way. That's why I've been running away from you, but now I can't. <laughs> well, I have to run. say that that's, that's totally understandable. <laughs> yeah. But also, because of the, the columns that you write, yeah. um, you're also in the public eye. I okay. mean, you, the, the, those, those are very considered, very well written uh, columns, I have to say. And I absolutely avidly read them every time they come out. But let's talk about something that 
you wrote about okay. in your latest um, column, that gruesome attack in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, have you heard enough from the president and his security team that something is being done to track down the people who carried out that attack and that insecurity in the North is front and center of the president's agenda? Yeah, I mean, is, uh, I mean, what happened in the uh, Savamari is really, really tragic. You know? I mean, is uh, I mean, Boko Haram had been killing before. Mm. He, mass uh, hundreds and thousands, but this one, they did it in such a way as to send a message because they took their time. Mm. They didn't just go there to shoot the farmers. They rounded them up mm. and then murdered them in cold blood like they did. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's is significant. I mean, it should be a turning point, like I wrote last week. Whether the authorities have, uh, I mean, you, you, there are reports now that the military are bombing the place, and they mm. are, yeah, th those are good measures. But I believe that we should go beyond military measures if we really want to get to the root of this challenge. Because I think part of the problem really is that adopting a military solution will not resolve the crisis in the Northeast or in the Northwest or anywhere at all. Mm. Because international security ordinarily is within the purview. It's the responsibility of the police. But we have ceded the responsibility to the military. So sometimes I, I am very sympathetic to the military because they have taken out too much yes. in terms of securing the country. So sometimes you want to sympathize with them. Sometimes you, I mean, when you, when you see excesses on their part, when you see failings, you, you tend to overlook some of their failings. But at the end of the day, the responsibility is still that of the president to secure the nation. Mm. And the, 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 if you look at the Senate resolution, that of the resolution by the House of Residency, the consensus is that the president is not pulling his weight on managing security, on, on uh, tackling mm. insecurity in the country today. And the president's core support yes. during the last election uh, came from the north, yeah. which is where a lot of this is happening. Yeah. Um, but now many of those same people who voted for him are calling for his resignation. But obviously the president isn't going for election again, is yeah. he? I mean, so we're talking about promises broken yeah. and more legacy issues. Yeah, I think the president should be more concerned about his legacy because mm. if you look at the north, Let's start from the northeast. Mm. Bonu is almost out of, getting out of hand. I mean, he, he, the, the, the Boko Haram crisis did not start he, he, yesterday. I mean, you, you, you can't blame the president for the Boko Haram crisis, mm. but you can blame him for how it is being managed now because he is in charge presently. Now, when you look at you, let's even leave the Boko Haram crisis and go to the northwest where the president comes from. Kashina is home state. I was there in June, mm. and what is happening in Kashina is, uh, is, is shocking. Is, yeah, very, very shocking because I spoke to the stakeholders. It, there are places in Kashina that cannot be accessed where bandits are practically taken over. They take people's wives, they take children, they do all kinds of things. So it's, uh, you have a situation of ungoverned spaces mm. everywhere in the northwest i mean from sokoto to sampara to to uh, kaduna mm. those are four states in the northwest that are practically taken over by bandits and then you move to the north central in niger state the senator told me just about three or four weeks ago that i could no longer could no longer go home that's niger state where bandits are also practically in charge so whichever area you look at in the north whether northeast northwest north central yeah, I mean, you have a crisis of insecurity everywhere. But what do you think has led to this crisis of insecurity? Because, I, think, I mean, it, it just keeps, it's got to a point, as you said, where yeah. it's just completely out of hand. Yeah, it's, it started gradually, but I don't think, just like I said, I don't mm. think we have managed it very well. But assessing responsibility to the military and practically ignoring the police mm. is, is, I believe that's part of the problem. Because even today, you talk about Savamari or anywhere, once there is crisis, we, nobody looks at the police. Mm. And look, if you look at the number of personnel in the entire uh, military, whether nav combine them, Navy, mm. Army, and the Air Force, they are not up to the number of policemen that we have. But we have a police, a police force today that is practically reduced to inactivity or passivity. And nobody, they are completely ignored and they can't even see the danger in that. If there's insecurity in any part of Nigeria today, people look towards the military, and mm. that's really good situation. But that's the situation we are in now. 
Well, what about the, I mean, something that's closer to your yeah. sort of um, province, if yeah. you like, the, the president's spokesman and how, spokesmen and how they, or spokespeople and yeah. how they presented Mr. Buhari's position on this. Do, do you think they've done all they can do in the circumstances or would you have handled it differently given that you were once a presidential spokesman I think yourself? The spokesmen have really tried because mm. they are dealing with a man who is not willing to talk at all. The best presidential spokesman is the president himself. Absolutely. So, in a situation where the president even he does not engage at all, I mean, look at Sabamari, even if he's only to give a statement, sign by him, talk, at least call the governor, do something. It has to take a president, and it's the same thing all over again. A presidential spokesman writing, this is what the president, we want to hear it from the Absolutely. president. I mean, so. In that kind of situation, what can a presidential spokesman do? So sometimes I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for both Mr. Adishina and Mr. Malam Sheikh Garba because, I mean, they are not the president. They, yeah. just, they, just, they are just spokes. So they can only, I mean, the only person you can blame in this instance is not the spokesman, but the principal. Do, do you think they sometimes have to guess what the president, how he would respond in those circumstances? I, I mean, I believe so. I, I, I mean, because sometimes you see these statements, and because I've worked, it's a terrain in which I've worked. Of course. They are just trying to manage a very bad situation. That's the way I see it. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and the president you served, Umaru Yaradua, yeah. was credited with bringing the militancy in the Niger Delta region to a halt by basically negotiating yeah. with the militants. Is there a military solution? I think you mentioned that earlier. In the north? Or would it have to be that kind of negotiating? Yeah, but they have tried it. Some governors have tried it and it failed. The governor of Kashina tried to negotiate with the bandits because they actually know them. I was mm. in Kashina and I spoke with the governor. They know these characters. But, I mean, these are people who have realized that criminality pays. And they have their own food soldiers. And given the prevailing economic situation, they, 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 and the fact that they have practically overpowered the state, it's difficult in that circumstance to begin to negotiate with those. I, I mean, it has proved very futile. Right. They tried it in Safara, it failed. They tried it in Kashina. So it's not something I would recommend. Well, I have to say that that's a very scary thought, but stay yeah. with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with one of Nigeria's best known political columnists and former presidential spokesman, Olusegun Adeniyi. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, fancy being a presidential spokesman or woman to front White House-style media briefings at the Asso Rock Presidential Villa in Nigeria? Well, perhaps you should talk to my guest today, Olusegun Adeniyi, who's had a journalism career to die for, one that started in 1991 and has taken him through four elite media houses, including The Guardian newspaper, African Concord magazine, The Concord Press and this day newspaper group where he is the current chairman of the editorial board. Not least, of course, he crowned it all by eventually ending up as presidential spokesman to the late Nigerian President Umaru Musa Yaradua. And if that's not enough, he's authored eight books and writes a popular, absolutely riveting weekly column in this day newspaper that holds the rapt attention of millions, including myself. And Shegun Adeni is still with me in the studio. And this, by the way, is his latest book, uh, Naked Abuse, Sex for Grades in African Universities. I would recommend it very highly. But Shegun, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. I saw an advert in the UK by Boris Johnson yeah. in July for a spokesman for the Prime Minister of Britain. Yeah. which was described as a chance to communicate with the nation on behalf of the Prime Minister. Yeah. The, the person um, would have excellent skills that included first-class risk management and crisis communication yeah. skills. Are, are those the kinds of skills that presidential spokesmen bring to the job in Asso Rock in Nigeria? Of course, uh, not only in Asso Rock, but everywhere. Mm. Incidentally, when I took the job in 2007. I, 
I went for a program in the U.S. I mean, I actually approached the U.S. embassy that I needed a crash program, and they arranged this visitor's program for me, where I met with the spokesman for the uh, the State Department and then the White House, uh, the spokesman to the then President George Bush. Presidentally, mm. Johnston is dead now. He died of cancer a few years ago. But I, I spent a day with him, observing him, and then we had a chat. And he told me some of these, uh, the rudiments of the job mm. and also the risk involved. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a glamorous job. It's a yes. job that a, a journalist would love to do, but it also comes with a lot of hazards. It comes with its own challenges like mm. any other job. I mean, I faced mine with the head of my boss. Well, I mean, me. you, you, you seemed very comfortable because I remember, yeah. I mean, being in communication with you. Yeah. And, and by the way, one thing I have to say for you, which I can't say for many others, that you were very approachable. Yeah. And I remember you, uh, I mean, uh, you, you, uh, you basically asked me to, f I flew into Nigeria, yeah. and you arranged lunch before myself, yourself, and the president. Yeah. And just the three of us yeah. sat down at the presidency and had lunch. One of the things I, I mean, enjoyed... Which, which was just extraordinary. I, I, one really. of the things I enjoyed was that I had the confidence of my boss. Yes, and, and you certainly told, did. I could, I could see him any time. Yeah. If somebody, if something happened at 12 midnight, I mean, my, my apartment was very close to where mm. I'll just drive to the villa. I know the stewards that can go to the president's room. I can scribble a note and say, this is, and the president, uh, he, he, will, I, he will do three things. Mm. He, I know. Uh, he could either reply me. Mm. He could, sometimes he will ignore me. Sometimes he will tell the steward to tell me to come back in the morning. But he was somebody whose confidence I had. That, and he that's was why, responsive. Yes. He yes. was always so, responsive. I mean, so that's why I would defend him. And, and uh, an interesting thing happened. You know, about eight months into the job, mm. uh, somebody very close to him called me and he said, look, he was high in the, somebody very high in the government called me and said, look, Shegun, the president cannot be happy with you. Of course, you know he doesn't talk. Because you, you come to a meeting, you will interrupt him. You will take a decision <laughs> everybody will support. I you like will take that. a different one. And I felt very bad. So that night, I just wrote a personal letter. So I put it in the newspaper. So the next morning, I put it in that. What I wrote basically was that, you know, I come from the newsroom. I had never done any other job before except being mm. a journalist. And coming with that kind of mentality, I mean, so I've made a lot of mistakes in my approach to issues and all that. Whatever I have done to, you should forgive me. Mm. So he called me. So once the quality ran after me and said, Oga said you should come back. So I came down and said, Sit down. So why mm -hmm. did you write me this letter? I said, no, I was reflecting. I said, no, you are not reflecting. Somebody spoke to you. I said, I was, he said, don't lie to me. So I told him that somebody, yeah, I said it. So you know, I said, you, he said, look, the day you took this job, we had a conversation. You may have forgotten, but I haven't forgotten. You said you want to tell me the truth to my face and defend me when I'm not there. And I appreciate that. I said, go and be doing your job. If I have any issue with you, I will tell you. And that day I knew I had this confidence. So um, that, that's why I could always approach him. Mm. And that's why, I mean, that's, I mean he's, uh, he's, he's, that's why I would defend him. When people want to assail his, of course people can abuse him. Even while I, I, I was a spokesman, I, I said, people can abuse the president. I mean, he comes with the terrain. Mm. But when you go, uh, when you want to assail his character, then I would defend him. Well, I have to say that one thing a lot of people would say for President Yaradua is that he was a very honest man, came across as very honest, very forthright. And I had the opportunity of meeting him once through you. Yeah. As I said, we sat down for lunch, and I, he came across to me. Five hours that day. A very long time, <laughs> I remember. I mean, it, it was, it was a, an absolutely extraordinary... I don't even remember the food that we ate, but I won't get into, into that. But I mean, absolutely so remarkable, Sunday afternoon, so remarkable we, man. Yeah. Very yeah. gently spoken, but yeah. radiated yeah. honest. Yeah. But, but in terms of what you were saying, that, that you, you, you were being honest with him, I mean, yeah. that's what really is expected of you, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're, you're supposed to be a special advisor, which is a class Exactly. Of, That's the job. Yeah. Special advisor Absolutely. on publicity and communication. Not necessarily uh, writing rejoinders and all that. I mean, you had to advise him exactly. on, on what to do, and that's the expectation. And like I, I was telling you, mm. I mean, my, I, I saw my job basically as projecting a good image for the president. Mm. If, for instance, economists wrote something negative, yes. I would call the economists and say, look, even if you don't like this man, you know I'm still here, I still have this job. I mean, I will do that kind of, those are the kind of informal interactions that I was doing. Yes. I mean, I also know how to write. 
But I know that it wouldn't help my boss in any way. Somebody attacked my boss and I attacked him back. I, I don't gain friends from yes. him, which basically was my job. I mean, that's the way I saw my yes. job. And, and did you find yourself often in competition with the Minister of Information, for instance? I mean, you know, who also sees himself as a spokesman for the government, if not directly the president? You know, I mean, it left for me. Mm. <laughs> I will scrap that office, Minister of Information. Well, it doesn't exist in most no, other places. No, I don't places. know what, what they do. But in, in, <laughs> during our time, I mean, the Minister of Communication, then, for information there was John Odey, who was my friend. Yes. So, and, yes, and I remember they, John Odey. They, they, they recognized the fact that, look, they were managing NTA, Radio Nigeria, and mm. all that. But they recognized the fact that I was president as spokesman. And I had the access that they didn't have. Mm. And I also used that access to help them. So that, I, I worked closely with them. but. Is a uh, for me a presidential spokesman is more powerful well, than I mean, the minister of information. Well, if you look at every every regardless you know, of whatever oh yeah. title, all all the big I, I don't see any countries in Europe or the United States or whatever having a, a minister of information. Yeah. I mean, it, it comes from the Soviet era. Yeah, there's that Cold War era. I mean, what you have is a presidential spokesman. Exactly. And, and that's really it. Um, I've always wondered why Nigeria. I mean, you may be able to tell us because yeah. you were, you know, obviously close to those to the you know, minister and so on. But why they chose to retain the position of minister? I think the, they have to. I mean, you have a situation where the constitution prescribes that every state must have a minister. So we have that six states in Nigeria today. So they have to create, find a way of creating right. functions for people. So I, I suppose that's part of the challenge. If, for instance, Ministries are rationalized, and we have 12 ministries today. I don't see how Ministry of Information will survive. Will, no, it will not. Do, do you think it's actually more crucial, I mean, or less crucial than, for example, the Ministry of Tourism, which appears to have been collapsed into something else? I don't, I mean, when you look at the Ministry of Information, they probably, uh, apart from managing NTA, Radio Nigeria, uh, which can obviously be manage themselves. So I mean, I don't know what else the minister, the ministry does. Right. But anyway, let me just point this out. This is uh, Shegu Adeni, his latest book. It's called Naked Abuse, Sex for Grades in African Univers uh, Universities. In 20 seconds, tell us what it's about. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, after the crisis at Ife, after the the, mm. the, the Akindele something, I... I decided I was going to do a, a, a book on the sex for great thing. That was in 2018. And then I approached Ford and I said they would fund the research for me, which that was how it started. And I spoke must be full of some pretty sordid stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that makes it worth reading, if nothing else. But Shegun, I want to thank you exceedingly thank for you. agreeing to be dragged in, kicking and screaming. <laughs> Shegun Adeni is, of course, the chairman of the editorial board of this day newspaper and former presidential spokesman. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Jeremy. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including the distinctive artwork of Nigeria's Jacqueline Suwari. Stunning pieces that are attracting lots of attention around the world. Stay with us.